thank you for for um, for joining today. Um, we wanted to welcome you to this is the second informational webinar we've held on this project, um, which is called TASI, which stands for Trauma Informed ACE Screaming and Intervention. It's a quality improvement project echo. Um, and we're excited to share this information with you today. So just wanted to acknowledge that this project is supported by our funder, the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, of the US Department of Health and Human Services. And we wanted to provide an opportunity to thank them for providing this incredible program to all of you and all of the practices that we're currently working with. Um, I also wanted to just mention that as usual, um, the, the contents of what we're gonna talk about today are not necessarily representative of the official view of HRSA. For more information about their, their programs, feel free to visit hrsa.gov. I have no disclosures to make today. I am the primary presenter, but we will have some others from our team who, can, who are welcome to chime in as we move forward as well. So just logistics, this is gonna be held, at, obviously it was initially gonna be held as a webinar, but we're now holding it as a meeting. Um, as usual, please feel free to um, unmute yourselves if, if you, if during our, our um, question and answer period at the end, we can be um, a little more relaxed on the, the meeting today. And feel free to utilize the chat feature. If you can put in the chat feature when you get a moment, just who you are and what state you're from I, and what practice you represent, that would be helpful for us to get an understanding of who is on the call today. So my name's Aldina Havdi. I'm a program director, a senior program director here at the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, social worker by training, have worked a lot in child welfare um, most of my life, but the last 16 years I've worked with pediatricians in some way. Um, and uh, just really excited to talk with you all today. So our agenda for the day, first of all, I'm gonna go over um, the project and what our vision and aims are for what we're doing. I'm gonna really just briefly go over some foundational science around adverse childhood experiences. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what it's like to be a, a practice site. Um, some of the objectives, some of the benefits, um, really focusing more on the benefits than some of the activities that we'll be working on. I'm going to give a brief overview of um, what a QI Project ECHO looks like, um, go over eligibility requirements and the application process, um, and then answer any questions that you guys might have. So I'm going to try and fly through this a little bit just to make sure that we have some time at the end to answer any questions. So our vision for this program really is that all primary care pediatricians and anyone who is serving in the role of working with kids implement a universal screening for ACEs and to routinely use and fully understand what ACEs are, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that today, and what toxic stress is to really enhance the quality of patient care. So as I'm moving forward, if you all can also put in the chat a little bit of information about um, what your knowledge is around adverse childhood experiences. Do you know nothing? Do you know a little? Do you know a lot? Um, that'll also help me to know kind of where I want to focus my efforts this morning on or this afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. So this is our hub faculty, and we're actually missing one person who was just added to our team. So um, Carissa Luckett and Dr. Steve Carries are both the principal investigators for this project. Um, Chris, Carissa is both a registered nurse and a social worker. Um, she serves as a QI coach and she has been working with pediatric practices as part of her work with the Center for Youth Wellness, which is now a program of Safe and Sound out in California. Um, she's been working with practices, pediatric practices for quite some time. And then Dr. Steve Carries, who serves as um, the medical director for the New Jersey chapter of the AAP. He's also a child abuse pediatrician. Um, obviously, he's been working with practices for many, many years. Um, and then we have Dr. Ruth Gubernick, who's also on our call today, along with Carissa. Um, and she is, serves as a quality improvement coach. She's been working with the AAP National and the NJAP for many, many years as a coach and helping practices and implement all kinds of different projects and systems into their pediatric practices. 
um, myself, I already introduced myself. And then we have our newest member is, um, well, our second to the last newest member is Dr. Alonzo Patterson, who is uh, a physician who has, was working with the original cohort um, from the National Pediatric Practice Community that worked with the Center for Youth Wellness. So he's been doing this work for some time. Um, and he, he was where you all are um, going to be if you sign up for this project. So it, um, he'll be a great addition to that team. And then our newest member is Stephanie Pinney, who is on here. Stephanie, if you can wave for me. She is a licensed clinical social worker um, and uh, has certification in um, substance abuse and drug counseling as well. Um, so she brings a wealth of knowledge and I'll be happy to let her introduce herself later if we, if we have time. So our aims of this project are, are twofold. So the first aim um, is to study how primary care settings can screen and provide care to kids impacted, kids and families, I should say, impacted by ACEs. So we really wanna look hard at the strengths of the project, the limitations, any kind of implementation challenges that we might have. Second is to produce a scalable model that can help pediatric providers effectively integrate screening using a strength-based trauma-informed approach in primary care settings. And as part of this project, and we'll get a little bit um, into this later, we're gonna be submitting a report to the United States Congress, which is a, a pretty exciting thing. So um, let me just look real quick in the chat here just to kind of see if anyone added anything about ACEs. So, okay, so quite a few people do know a little bit about ACEs. So I will go through this briefly, just in case there's someone who hasn't, um, who hasn't um, shared in the chat. A little bit about ACEs science. So ACEs are, in a nutshell, um, they're potentially traumatic experiences that happen before the age of 18. The term ACEs actually comes from um, an adverse childhood experiences study that was conducted back in the late 90s by doctors Vincent Paletti and Robert Anda. One was from the Centers for Disease Control and one was from Kaiser Permanente. It was one of the largest investigations that had ever been conducted to assess the connections between early diversity and adult health. And the study was um, the first of its kind that had over 17,000 participants. These participants were primarily Caucasian, college educated. Um, and I should say this study has been replicated over and over again um, with pretty, um, pretty similar results. The study is really based on the basis for 10 core adverse childhood experiences or ACEs often characterized in three different categories that you see here, abuse, neglect and household instability or household dysfunction. And they include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, living in a household where a member has severe mental illness or substance dependence. And this doesn't have to be a caregiver. This can be anyone who lives in the household um, where the child has witnessed violence against anyone in the household, I would say, not just the mother, not just the father, it could be any violence in the household, or there's been a separation or care of, from a caregiver due to incarceration, um, any kind of shifting parental relationships, whether it's separation or divorce, any of those things could, could potentially be classified as an ACE. And then there are all of these additional adversities and the AP has done a lot of work in looking at some of the things that we now all know as social determinants of health. So this could be community and school violence. Unfortunately, we've been seeing all too much of that in the news lately um, that I know um, has been really, really challenging to see. Um, there has been uh, obviously a whole lot of racism um, and, you know, just discrimination, social injustices, those are also, also additional adversities. Um, this could also mean homelessness or housing instability or food instability. Like we talked about earlier, it could be separation from family, but talking, taking it a step further, it could be separation due to a child being placed in foster care. Or look at all of the stuff happening around the world over the last several years regarding immigration and deportation. Um, it could also be a caregiver's serious physical illness 
um, that can cause additional adversities and then death. And obviously, if you think about all of these things combined, the first the slide that I just showed you and these, it's kind of like one of those, it can be an additional layer of things over on top of each other, right? Of additional things that are, that are happening that over time create this toxic environment for children and families. And all of these things put together, we really like to put it, um, uh, someone came up with this, um, Dr. Wendy Ellis and um, Dietz, um, they came up with this incredible framework for this pair of ACEs that really looks at all those things that we talked about, right? Including maternal depression, all of those things, plus all these other things that are like the roots, right? That, that cause additional, um, additional difficulties whether it's um, any of those sort of social determinants of health that, that you know, we often have very little control over. In general, um, what the ACE study told us was really striking. It told us a couple of things. One, ACEs are really common among the general population with over two thirds of the adult population having experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. We also have data that shows that nearly half of all children today have experienced at least one ACE and that ACEs accumulate over childhood. It's not something, um, you know, these are, these are things that accumulate over the course of childhood. I like this slide a lot because it really talks about just what is toxic stress. So we know we've been talking about adverse childhood experiences and how it can, you know, lead to this toxic stress. It really is different than the average stress of, you know, starting the first day of work or starting kindergarten or any of those kinds of stresses. It's really the prolonged activation of your body's stress response system that can actually disrupt the developing brain and the architecture of the brain and the way all of that functions, the way our body functions, our organs. Um, and it can increase the risk for those stress-related diseases and cognitive impairments well into the adult years. So this slide is really great in kind of reviewing the, the different mechanisms of toxic stress. So as we talked about, you have the ACEs, but you also have these protective factors naturally in, in you know, everyone has them. I think those are really important to really talk about as well. Um, and some of us have predisposed vulner vulnerabilities um, based on sort of, uh, you know, just our, our bodies and the way they function. Um, so when we talk about toxic stress, like we said in the last slide, we're talking about it, it, a real dysregulation that happens within our brains, within our systems, within our immune systems, endocrine systems, all of those things that can really create huge changes within our, within our bodies. So ACEs and the top causes, 10 causes of death in the United States, I find this fascinating that when we look at all of these top 10 causes of death in the United States, we, we usually think about, you know, um, those, those typical things of, you know, diet and exercise. And while those things can definitely help, I think what's less often thought about is how toxic stress and adverse childhood experiences can actually um, can actually uh, increase the likelihood of, you know, dying from all of these um, sorts of, of difficulties or really even attempting suicide. So if you look at the suicide attempts, it's 37.5%, the odds ratio with if you have four or more adverse childhood experiences. We're not talking about one adverse childhood experience. We're talking about four or more adverse childhood experiences. Um, and if you look at Alzheimer's, it's 11.2%, and you can see the other percentages there. Um, I think the, the really important thing to note about this slide is without any sort of intervention, and intervention can help to, to buffer some of what we're seeing here in the, in the ratios. But without intervention, there can be, can be, not always, but can be a 20-year difference in life expectancy, which is uh, really a lot to think about. And not all individuals experience toxic stress as a result of negative experiences. So the more positive experiences, the more supports that we have, 
um, the more we're able to balance some of these negative experiences. Um, and I think is something that um, one of my amazing colleagues who's on this phone today, um, Molly Peterson, shared on our last call is those pause, it really does take sometimes just that one person in your life that can can make a huge impact on on your life and and whether or not you you know you you are able to um, handle some of those negative experiences that are happening in your life and that really speaks to the resiliency speaking of resiliency there are other factors that can help to build resilience and buffer trauma through um, what we like to call the domains of wellness this was a term um, coined by the Center for Youth Wellness and, and something they've done a lot of research on. So those seven, and I know they're, they're working on others right now, but there are seven right now, supportive relationships. We just talked about that. Eating healthy, sleeping well, um, and just sleep hygiene in general. And sleeping well can mean something different for everyone because everyone requires different amounts of sleep. Um, I've learned that. Um, using movement, um, practicing mindfulness, supporting mental health, um, and spending time outside with nature. So now I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're looking for when we talk about the, the sites that we are looking to recruit for this particular project. Um, so Ardina, yeah. there, there was a question in the chat. I don't know if we want to... Um go over that now. So someone had asked if they thought that COVID would be included in um, new ACEs studies. If who, what would? If um, COVID. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think, I think we are all, we have all experienced at least one ACE as a result of COVID, right? So 100%, absolutely. Okay. So just looking at this slide, our demonstration site program, which is what we're calling it, is really a partnership. As part of this partnership, we will bring you together with a quality improvement coach who's going to help you to create a plan to start screening for ACEs and help you overcome barriers as you encounter them. We have 17 practices that we've been working with for our first cohort of the project. And I wanted to share a little bit about that with you. Um, our 17 projects or, or practices are from all over the country. So this is really um, a unique project in that it's really bringing together people, not just from one state, but from multiple states. We have eight different states that we're working with um, from New Jersey to New York, Maryland, North Carolina. We have practices from California, Delaware, Arizona, and Kentucky. Um, so I think it's pretty amazing opportunity to be able to partner with people kind of outside of our own spheres as well. Um, as part of, we have a couple of folks that have written um, a, a quote for us. We had someone who worked with um, the National Pediatric Practice Community when, when Center for Youth Wellness was running this program um, from the Santa Barbara Clinic. And they said that they have benefited immensely from the partnership with the National Pediatric Practice Community as they have implemented screening for ACEs and resiliency-focused interventions in all four of their community clinics. The NPPC provided clinical expertise, organization-wide staff training, patient educational materials, and ongoing individualized coaching as they introduced and expanded screening. Through partnership, our organization was able to provide the opportunity to learn best practices from other pediatric settings screening for ACEs. And I think that's really nice to hear. We've had a lot of, um, of practices that we're currently working with that have talked a lot about how this has really benefited them to the point where they wanna participate again um, in the project. Unfortunately, we, we need to um, open it up for other folks to participate. Um, we are looking for, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, but we're looking for, currently for this cohort, we're looking for about 10 to 15 practices to participate in the project. And so the objectives are, um, there are three objectives of the project. First, to identify and learn how to overcome common barriers in screening and provide these evidence-based interventions, which are the domains of wellness that we discussed. 
through this tailored content, tailored coaching, and this collaboration between the different project sites, the different practices. We want to facilitate an opportunity for a really robust understanding of everyone's unique journey to screening. Everyone's coming at it from a different angle. Everyone has a different amount of support within their practices. And to really think about how these learnings can be translated into strategies for similar practices. And then finally, we want to increase the number and diversity of practices that are screening for ACEs and really providing these evidence-based interventions for kids and adolescents and really just families in general who have experienced ACEs. So why participate in this project? Obviously, you guys are all on because you're really interested in this topic area or maybe you just wanted to hear more, um, to, but you're obviously all thinking about it. Um, so really, you're, you, you want to participate if you are really interested in implementing ACEs screening. Um, it is a complex process, but we can provide the support to really help you through that process. Um, we really provide the ability for you all to leverage um, our insights and our experience and the experiences of those who have come before you, those practices that we're currently working with, um, to really help you implement a more successful program in your practice. You will have access again to quality improvement coaches who will be working with you individually um, as practice team members. We have a ton of training materials, educational handouts in multiple languages for you to utilize. Um, and we provide you with just a lot of guidance and handholding throughout the process. Um, I think the most exciting piece, if that's not exciting enough, the most exciting piece to me is that at the end of this project, we're gonna be submitting a report to the United States Congress to really help to inform national guidelines on ACEs screening. So benefits of the project. Um, we have a $15,000 stipend for each project that practice that participates. Um, we have 25 part four maintenance of certification points that have been approved by the American Board of Pediatrics. We have 13 continuing medical education and MOC part two points available as well. Um, you will have access to your practices data in real time. We're using um, what's called KEDA or a quality improvement data aggregator system. Um, we will be providing again, you, we're providing you and your practice teams with ongoing technical assistance with again, quality improvement coaches and experts in the field of ACEs screening. And also being able to learn from one another. I think is huge. So this is a stressful slide and, and might scare you a little bit, but suffice it to say, we'll help you through this whole process. Um, really what we're looking for is um, you to identify a team of at least three to participate in the program, looking at a pediatric champion or someone who can serve as the team lead for the group, someone who can serve as the data lead, we'll talk about these roles in a minute, and an admin lead. So we do, as every project that we have that, that you know, provides the MOC part four points, we do request a pre and post provider survey so that we can learn more about you and, um, and your background and maybe some of your knowledge and attitudes and understanding so that we can see kind of where that ends up at the end. Obviously, we want you to increase your knowledge as you're going on through the program with us. Um, we have monthly echo session evaluations that are really important for us to figure out what we can do better to serve you. Um, we have an onboarding workshop that will really provide you with all the information that you need for you and your team to begin this work, as well as a really in-depth um, ACES training workshop that Carissa does. Um, and then every month we'll have 75 minute echo sessions um, that we've we've organized to, to make life, you know, really simple for you. We'll go through what those sessions look like in a moment. <coughs> um, you'll be utilizing um, the PEARLS validated screening tool to screen your target population of children anywhere between the ages of birth to 20, beginning with a small group of patients. Um, we find that works best for people to really focus on a a targeted population, whether it's an age range or a particular age to begin the work. Um, we will have to collect data throughout the project just to kind of see how you're doing. So we will ask that 
you know, we have some team members of yours who will be able to help you with that process. Um, as part of the ECHO model, case presentations are really important. So similar to what you did um, when you used to go to grand rounds, um, it's really important to submit those case presentations so that we can help, um, you know, either provide some additional coaching, you can share some of the successes or maybe some of the challenges that you've had and have that peer-to-peer -peer learning and, um, and learning with some of the experts on the call. We are also gonna be holding um, coaching calls um, with your um, QI coach um, and even some additional drop-in office hours as needed to provide you with some additional support if you need it. Um, and then at the end of the project, there's gonna be a focus group for you to be able to share your feedback. Um, we're gonna be recruiting um, parents, caregivers, and adolescents to complete satisfaction surveys because it's not just important to hear how it was on your end, it's really important for us to understand um, how patients, you know, whether they be parents, caregivers, or adolescents um, are experiencing this on their end as well, because we want to learn from everything that we're doing. So as hey, we Aldina, talked, yeah. Um, just wanted to pause for a couple questions. Um, so Carissa had answered one, but I'll just read it um, in case uh, people aren't following the chat. So someone had asked if we have uh, federally qualified health centers that are participating and Chris has said, yes, we do. And we would love to have more participate Absolutely. in the next two cohorts. Um, someone had asked about the team leader, which I know we're, we're gonna get to on this slide. Yep. Um, and if, if they have to be a, a clinical provider. So we'll get to that in a second. And then um, someone had asked when we are reporting to Congress with the, uh, um, you know, the update about the, the project. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our requirement from HRSA is to report by August of next year. So we'll just, we'll have the results from cohort two by that time. Unfortunately, we won't have the results from cohort three, um, but we'll be able to share um, the results of both the two cohorts with Congress at that point. So that's really exciting. And yes, we are looking for, uh, and I think this is coming up in future slides, but we are looking for a very diverse group of practices to participate. So FQHCs, we're looking for practices from rural, urban, suburban areas, um, those who are um, working with, with TRICARE, with the military population on Indian health reservations. Really, we want the most diverse group of practices, ideally. So when we look at the applications, we're going to be choosing practices based on that, um, that whole making sure that we have a good mix for each of the cohorts. Um, thank you so much. Those are really good questions. Um, and I think I have like a couple more slides and then, and then we'll, we'll pause so that we can take some more questions. So like I said, we do need a pediatrician champion or a team lead who's really the primary point of contact for the project. Um, this person is gonna make sure that the team participates on these calls. Um, then there's a data lead who is really gonna be a member of your IT team or your change management team who can help support any kind of EHR builds and de-identify data reporting that we have. Um, and then there's the admin lead, who is often the practice manager or the nurse manager, who's really going to ensure that the team has, you know, the time needed to fully participate in this project. So participation from other team members might include nurses and nurse practitioners. Um, we are looking to get continuing nursing education credits for this so that the nurses can also receive credit for the project. Um, front nurse and patient service representatives or your office staff, your medical assistants, your physician's assistants, and anyone else really from your team who is, um, who is an integral part of your team because we really do think that everyone who is in the practice is integral to that work. Again, I think I already noted at least one of these um, at the end of the project, in addition to the parent caregiver and adolescent survey, we're also going to ask that you participate in a focus group, again, just so that we can learn more about, you know, what went well, what didn't go so well, what you need more support with, that sort of thing. And then we're um, allowing for this quarterly educational echo 
following your participation so that you can continue to learn, continue to sustain the work and collaborate with your peers um, and others. So the wonderful thing about this is the cohort two folks will then be able to collaborate with the cohort one folks in these quarterly sessions. And we will provide CME MOC part two for those, those sessions. <clears throat> so for those of you who are not familiar with Project ECHO, we keep talking about this and being the ECHO model. Um, ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And it's really just a great way to utilize technology, or in this case, the Zoom platform, to really leverage all the resources that we have available to us in this virtual environment. Um, to really share best practices, um, to really make it as engaging and as um, a, a learn, a, a more of a learning environment as possible. Um, it allows folks to be able to better manage um, some of the patients they're working with by um, not just doing it, but also by showing how it's done. Um, we are going to have as part of the ECHO model is um, having a didactic patient presentation each time on a particular topic area. Apologize to the dog in the background whining. Um, it really does provide a great opportunity from learning from each other and from being able to do some, um, some problem solving as well. So our sessions are, are, are structured um, in 75 minute sessions. So it, we found that that was an hour was just a little bit too short. Um, we have them every second Tuesday of the month. Um, there is always a welcome and introduction, a case presentation or two, and some discussion time, a review of the data, um, really at the aggregate level, but we will be sharing your individual data with you um, to help you improve, and then some sort of lecture on a particular topic, um, and then we close out the session. What we are looking at in terms of timeline for this project is a start in September. So September 14th is the virtual orientation session. The 21st is gonna be the ACES 101 training. And then from October to May, we're gonna have those monthly educational or edu echo sessions. Um, we'll have our coaching calls. We'll have um, you know data submissions, some QI activities, the surveys will happen at the end, as well as the focus group in May at the end. And so you might be asking, okay, so am I eligible? What's the application process like? All of those sorts of things. Really, you're eligible if you have an interest, a real high interest in integrating ACES screening into your practice, but you are not currently doing it. So you could be a practice that is had started to do it, but then maybe stopped because you just didn't know how to do it. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know how to have these conversations. Um, that's, that's an appropriate practice to, to apply for this project. Um, if you are a practice that's been doing it universally, um, I, I, it, it's not really the, the type of project for you because we're really looking for someone who's really kind of at the beginning stages of it or who has never done ACEs screening before. We are also, um, you know, you're eligible if you have those resources, whether it's within your own office or with your community to provide, or you have, a, again, a partnership with any sort of resources within your communities. Um, you also need to have the capacity to start a screening program. So we really think of this as a, a team effort. It really does take everyone in the practice to be on board with this. It can't just be one, one doc who is, um, who is trying to lead, lead the way. It really does, we really do need to make sure that everyone is on board um, and that you can get to, get to working on a reporting system and, and looking at your EHR, um, any kind of EHR builds within three months of the orientation session. Um, obviously, you all have capacity for web-based meetings. That's what this is being held on right now. Um, we need a commitment from at least one member of your staff to attend these sessions. We understand you can't close up shop in order to participate in this project. So really, it's one person um, and then the other folks. We will be recording all of our sessions who will be able to go back in and kind of listen to those sessions. Um, the ability to hear to the project timeline that we're talking about today, um, agreement to fully utilize our coaching expertise and the technical assistance that are provided, 
Um, and again, since we're publishing this in a report to Congress, consent to publish findings from the project. So we had our application um, has been available since June 7th. Um, this is our second informational webinar. We had a first one um, earlier this, this month. Um, our applications are due on July 29th, so there's still a little over a month um, for you all to work on those applications. We plan to notify practices of our selection by August 26th, so there is some time. Um, I'm sure Lydia is feverishly putting stuff in the chat for you, but um, if you are interested, you can go to njap.org forward slash TASI and actually find the application and a whole host of other information, informational materials on there. And here's some information. We'll be sending you in, um, an information out soon. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I am going to hopefully see you all and see if you are interested or if you have any questions or if any of my team members have anything that they wanna share that um, I didn't get a chance to share. And I apologize for going so quickly, but I realized we only have 10 minutes left. So I just wanted to make sure I got through it all. We did have um, another question in the chat that Lydia did answer. Someone had asked if um, the providers that were signing up for the project would be required to travel. Um, so Lydia did you know, answer and you had answered also that the um, everything is done virtually. So there will be no required traveling for the project. Exactly which is the beautiful thing too. I think that's um, makes it makes it a little bit more uh, manageable for some of the practices. So I'm curious, um, I wanna take a peek at the chat. So can you, can you share, Stephanie, like how many different states are on? I don't I know that we asked um, everyone to put in um, you know, their names, their, their practices, where they're from. Yeah, I did that in the beginning, but I oh, think okay. I only see one person from North, North, Northern California is, yeah. is in here. If you guys can pop in the chat or you can unmute yourselves too. Um, it's very casual. I think we, we have just a small group here today. So that makes it a little bit more manageable. See, we got New Jersey, we have Oregon. And if you have any questions about the project, we'd love to hear them as well. Colorado. Yay, Colorado. Uh, this is Lydia. I do want to take a moment to tell you guys. So we do have those three positions, but you can have if you only have two people on your team and you divide those positions into two people, if you are one person, but you are so hung, so in love with ACEs and you're ready to start ACEs screening at your practice, you can definitely apply. Um, but also if you have a bunch of people on your team that wanna participate, um, you just need to decide those three roles, but you can have more people from your, your team or practice participate. In fact, the more the, the better. Dr. Gubernick, did I miss anything? Um, I was just going to uh, put in the chat uh, the fact that the monthly coaching calls um, will, the sessions will be scheduled based on the days and time of the week each month that work best for you and your team. So the coaches will work with you. You'll, you know, put forward a few choices that, that may work and uh, match up um, what will be done you know, what will work best. They're not more than an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Oh, um, I do notice we have Dr. Karafides on the line. And Dr. Karafides has been participating in our project um, for cohort one. I'm not sure if you wanna share anything from, from your experience, Dr. Karafides. So we really had a good experience with um, doing the cohort one with Tassie. We've learned so much from the experience from everything from not only the mechanics and, and the workflow of how to introduce it and um, 
how we are talking to parents about stress, how we're talking to them about protecting um, from long-term stresses through those seven domains of wellness. Um, and we've just had such great communication with our families. Um, families that we didn't know were experiencing high levels of stress have really been able to share that with us families who didn't share with us any stresses, but once we've opened up the conversation about how stress impacts our health and everything else have just really become very open. That's great. Thank you so much. And I know you were excited to try and do a, a, another cohort um, and unfortunately, yeah, we, we, uh, we have limitations in what we can do, but what's really exciting is that we will have these opportunities for these educational sessions that will be held quarterly for cohort one to continue that work on a quarterly basis to sustain the work, to sustain the relationships with, with the, with the support of our team and our coaching, um, and our experts. And then once cohort two is done, they will be joining cohort one folks, which I think will be a beautiful thing um, to be able to continue to help to sustain the work because it is, um, it is something that, you know, like with any sort of practice change, you don't wanna just participate in a project and then do it for the project and be done. I think most folks who are, wanting to do this work, want to do it for the long term. And so we want to be able to provide that support for practices to be able to do that work. Um, does anyone have any questions for us? You have a lot of our team members. You have uh, um, such wisdom Aldina, on this team. I have yeah. um, a really good question here. It's in a direct message, but someone was asking more about the tools that we use. So I don't know if we wanna talk a little bit about the pearls and then um, maybe I, I think it already came up, but like the resources that we provide our practices. Perfect, Carissa, I'll let you take it away. Sure, we are asking that you use the pearls tool, which is the pediatric um, events and um, life related screener, which does cover the 10 core ACEs. Um, this tool is um, uh, required for use for screening in the state of California, so we want it and is acceptable for billing in that state. Um, the Center for Youth Wellness participated in the research and the validation of the tool. Um, we also provide you with patient education handouts on what are ACEs, what is toxic stress, the seven domains of wellness, which are the brief interventions we're recommending um, in the office, um, as well as scripts on all of these handouts for your staff as well. And the screening tool and all of the education are available in English and Spanish, and we'll have four other threshold languages um, together very soon. Um, the Pearl screener does ask about the 10 core ACEs, as well as the seven additional adversities that Aldina went over in the beginning of the presentation. And um, there are various forms of that. There's a parent uh, report for the child, a teen self-report, and a parent report for the teen as well. And we allow you all to choose uh, which tool would be most appropriate based on your target audience that you're going to be screening initially. Um, and then we have all kinds of other tools available and patient education handouts, um, other resources for your staff, um, for training, as well as they are all of your staff is welcome if you are accepted to come to the orientation to hear about ASA screening. We certainly do not limit any participation in any of the ECHO sessions. Um, if you want to um, even use the recordings later with your staff, you're welcome to do that as well. 
And just mentioning that it, it, you know, these many of these materials are available in several other languages as well. If you wanted to just take a peek at the, the njap.org forward slash TASI website, we have a lot of these things posted on there. So feel free to poke around and take a peek at those. Um, I think that would be helpful just so you can get a better understanding. Um, we also have all of these saved in, um, if you become uh, a, one of these practices that we're working with, we have it all saved in one place so that when you go to enter your data, you can also access all these different resources for yourself. Um, and we, we will be sending sort of an, you know, a, a nice guide to you, hard copy as well in the beginning of the project. Um, so I hope, I hope that is helpful. One last thing, if you're an organization yeah. that is involved with uh, training residents, um, medical students and residents, that we've had some of the cohort one teams, um, that's been the case, and they have found that um, being able to train and talk about this topic and to be able to get these the residents involved with the screening and the follow-up um, has been something that they have been very excited about in, as they move forward in their careers. And if you don't have a lot of referral uh, resources at your fingertips for this program, please don't worry about that. We can help you identify some needs in the community and also work with you on setting up um, uh, connections in your community and appropriate referrals. Please don't let that be a hindrance to participation. Absolutely. And then I, I know it's one o'clock, so I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time, uh, or one o'clock my time, Eastern time, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I, I, do, I do know Lydia um, just popped in the chat, the, um, the website again, where you can go to learn more. Um, and within that website is a link for, um, for the application, which is in SurveyMonkey. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Lydia, if you can just pop my information um, email in the chat, thank you very much. And, and Molly's, that's great. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or peruse our website. And, um, and if you have any questions after that, we'd be happy to answer them. But thank you all very much for joining. And thank you to my wonderful team of folks here. And um, we hope to see your application come through. Thank you so much.